time to uh, be with us today and to uh, subject yourself to this interview. We're delighted that uh, we can we can have this time together. Oh, I love it. Yes, your uh, preaching has been such an influence on so many lives. Your preaching was uh, decisive in helping me discern my own call, and it was particularly your practice of expository preaching that has. Uh, it meant so much to me, and it's meant so much to so many. And I just wanted to talk with you about that uh, today, especially. Uh, and uh, you've been called the best expository preacher in America in our time. And I'm curious, and I think many would be curious, just to know, how did this, how did this way of preaching, expository preaching, become so important to you? It, it all started with how I became a believer, because uh, I went uh, as a young student to uh, Cal Berkeley as a, a freshman and growing up in a, in, in a very warm and supportive family, but my, my, our, our mother was a, an Episcopalian and was devout. My dad was then really nothing. He had, had been in a Christian science background, but he was nothing then. And so we were not really, uh, it was not a part of our lives, really. And then I come to Cal and my first two years, I, I don't particularly go to church or anything that I can remember. And then in the middle of my sophomore year, uh, a man who became a dear friend, Arba Hudgens, was uh, in, in a work group with me at Barrington Hall, which was a, a male dorm at Cal. And he said, we have a little Bible study group. There's a little group of us, and they were all guys. And, and I knew who they were because it was a, a, a large hall, but I, I knew who they were. And they said, why don't you come? So I, I went. And they, they, they were just sort of inching their way through a New Testament books. And the first, the first time I went, I had to look on, because I, I didn't bring a Bible to Cal with me. So that week I went out and bought, a, a new, I make a joke about this, I went out to the Save the Gate bookstore and bought a Bible that, that week. And for one dollar extra, I got my name on it. I still have that Bible with the little <laughs> name put on. But it was the King James Version which I'm glad I got because I love the King James. But I went to the Bible study group the next week and I had my, I said, I had a Bible now. And they said, oh yeah, that's nice. So we're reading the RSV because they were all looking at the RSV. So then I had to go out and get another Bible that week, a paper graph back that time. To make a long story short, one day I just said to myself, I, I think I would like to be a pastor like our college pastor was. Carl Thomas was a college pastor at the church. I I'd like to do that because I'm enjoying this so much. And I went and talked to Dr. Mugger, and he said, well, you have to go to seminary. So I applied, and I applied to Princeton Seminary. And I went really almost as a, uh, a, a really raw recruit in terms of knowing anything really about theology or about the historic uh, great verities. While I was there, I began to yearn for uh, the same sort of small group Bible study, male Bible study group I'd had in Berkeley. And I'll never forget, Glenn stood up in this rowdy place and he shouted out, hey you guys, this guy is from the seminary and he uh, said he'd like to lead us in a Bible study group. Do you wanna do that? And they said, okay. And so that began what was for me in my three years at Princeton, so that was the beginning of my career at Princeton. Uh, as a matter of fact, Princeton Seminary forgave me the need to have field ed because I had five of these small Bible groups, study groups uh, at Princeton and one at Rutgers. And, the, and Princeton knew about it. If I could get somebody to look at the text, sooner or later, the text would always point them to its setting. The Old Testament, by anticipation, points to Jesus Christ. The fulfillment. The New Testament by witness points to Jesus Christ. He wins their respect. And, the, and I concluded at that point, while I was a student at Princeton, that the best ethics would come when you're focused on Jesus Christ, who the Old Testament points to. That's far better than looking at grim passages to find guidance in the Old Testament that need to be fulfilled. And they were fulfilled by Christ. And I, I, had, I came up with a definition of exposition. It's enabling a text 
to make its own point with and then that that's very important you've got to let a text make its own point within its setting then that's the context and then as a uh, because it points to Christ always then it, you have a right to say within its gospel fulfillment setting let it make its point wait it out and let it happen and when I came to Seattle here I decided to build my ministry with youth around small Bible study groups. Uh, your Bible studies were the, the means by which you began to build this ministry, and it transferred to your pulpit ministry. Yeah. C.S. Lewis is one of the best lines on Bible study. Tell me what the hard words mean, and you've done more for me than a thousand commentaries see the words and then ask why was that word used what did the word mean when saint paul used it or if if and since i i am in my view our lord taught mainly in greek because i go with Anne rice when he was in uh, in the in the flight to egypt they went the the holy family went to alexandria alexandria was the one city in the empire that that did not persecute jews that's important then for a person, a pastor, not to jump in too quickly to give major interpretations. Let the text unfold. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, that approach to, uh, to teaching uh, honors the text and also protects us from a lot of, uh, you might say, uh, extravagant statements. I, you know, I always say about Bible study, that lean is better than luxurious. Uh, the leanest interpretation is usually the best. The extravagant interpretation is usually an agenda foisted upon the text. Yes. Did you realize how deeply rooted this way of preaching is in the Reformed tradition when you began? Well, you know, uh, I did when I read Luther's commentaries. I, I love Luther, mm -hmm. uh, in, and now he's in, the, in our Augustinian re Reformed right. tradition, but Calvin also. What I loved about Calvin is how clear he is mm -hmm. and how words are so carefully chosen by Calvin. Mm -hmm. And the way he does his summaries at the beginning of each chapter, mm -hmm. there's that kind of, but it's very expositional. Mm -hmm. And as a, com as, as a Bible expositor, except for he didn't do Revelation, but he did every other book, and his commentaries are always clear. Like Bart said, he didn't much care whether you liked him, but he wanted to be sure you understood him. <laughs> right. And there is that clarity of letting the words be what they were really saying. And, it, and that, that lean rather than luxurious model of interpretation protects you from a lot of nonsense that, that can happen. Yes. Claritas and brevitas, yes. the model. Yep. But also this commitment to Lectio Continua pre uh, preaching, that is preaching through books of the Bible consecutively rather than a common lectionary or topical or thematic preaching. This is what distinguished Re Reformed and Lutherans from the beginning was this commitment to conti Lectio Continua preaching. Yep. And you have modeled this so brilliantly for so many years. Uh, where did you, did you see it modeled before? Uh, did you, had you heard that kind of preaching before? I wouldn't say that Bob Munger modeled it as much. Bob Munger was very, in, in the pietistic tradition, uh, almost the Methodist pietistic mm -hmm. tradition in, in many ways, but he was reformed. Mm -hmm. and, and his big secret was his Christ-centeredness. But his approach to the text would be to honor the text and, and then focus on Christ, and that was that's what he did that really helped me. So I wouldn't say I, but John Mackay was expositional. Yeah. Yeah. And I always credit John Mackay as a bigger influence uh, and almost Helmut Tielicke because Tielicke always, and I love this about Tielicke, he always tries to make three observations or four observations. And I, I'm, I, I borrowed that from him. I, I'll do that. I'll make observations on the, on the text. First, let the text speak as best you can help, and then make some observations. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and then the observations, like in, in John Mackay, the observations ended up with fireworks often in his sermons. That's where there would be a lot of fireworks. But it's, it's because the text is now being allowed to explode, being allowed to really break free. And I think that is a wonderful moment when that can happen. Mm -hmm. Yes. Does that kind of preaching over time shape congregations in ways that thematic or topical preaching might not? Well, you know, it, I think it does. Luther used to end. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I put this in one of my articles I wrote on exposition. The influence of Luther's lectures on Romans were, was quite substantial with me because he would end, uh, he would end a, a section by saying, that's enough for today. That's the way to, and I, so in, in my own article I wrote on exposition, I said uh, exposition should end quickly. End your sermon quickly. Now I, yesterday, even here at UPC did it because, and people kidded me afterward because they knew that George had asked me, George Hinman, had asked me to preach on Romans 4 and Romans 5 in his series on Romans. So I took him literally. In Romans 4, I, I, I set it up, and I said, and I didn't say, well, that's enough for today, but I did say, now, next week, see, I, I was famous for that. Yeah. Next week, we'll watch how Paul makes this really clear. Yeah. He's making it clear now, but he's gonna make it really clear. Yeah. But rather than to steal from Paul, and take maybe one of those great lines from the future, let it come when it comes. Mm -hmm. So you're taking a risk with people, because mm -hmm. sometimes you know, people, they want to hear the most spectacular line first. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I try not to do that. I try to, uh, wet, and so I did a lot of that kind of preaching where I would, okay, next week then. There's an anticipation Good. the next week and not necessarily tying, up a, tying it up with a nice bow. You let it, you drop them. And I've, and I've experienced that, and it, and, it, and it leaves questions open. You've spoken of Dr. Mackay and his influence, and may, perhaps you could say more about him, but are there others who have been influential conversation partners over the years? In well, Dale Bruner. Yes. Uh, Dale Bruner, uh, we have done a lot of things together, and we're great friends uh, through the years, but I mean, Dale, he's very bold, a lot more bolder than, bolder than I am. When he does exposition, he always prepares his own translation, just like the Anchor Bible. He prepares his own translation of the text. Mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't even, well, maybe he should honor the RSV and say, now the RSV puts it this way, or the, Anna, the new RSV or the Jerusalem Bible. I often do that. I, I, like, I like to let people know the way other translations will handle the text. Uh, Dale rarely will do that as much. He just does his own translation of the text and then it's and then you and then you discover it. You journey through it. And Dale has done that for years. Are there uh, resources that you typically use when you prepare? Theological dictionary of the New Testament, theological dictionary of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, and that takes time. And I have them right there in my study at home in front of me. And I have of course my Arnt Gingrich, and all the lexicons. I have lexicons of the Hebrew, and I have, of course, international lexicon, and I, they all help. And, and it takes time to do the sleuthing, but you know, I love the sleuthing of words. And I get that from Lewis. Lewis, and Lewis got it from Tolkien. Tolkien was absolutely captured by language. In fact, that's one way to describe the... Lewis was, was captured by the, um, the surprise, surprise of joy, the breakthrough. But so was Tolkien. But Tolkien saw the surprise in language. Like he said, uh, why, how, did you make, how did you dream up Lord of the Rings? How did you create that story? He said, I didn't create the story, I found it. I found the story. Where'd you find it? In the language. I found it in the words. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. I, I, I think that that's really what exposition is trying to do too. Yes. Yes. 
is there are there theological resources that help you in that process of translation of, of using language? Bonhoeffer for sure. I think Bonhoeffer is a is a really interesting uh, expositor. Sometimes uh, not as helpful as other times, but you usually like his his unfinished book Ethics, where he talks about penultimate and ultimate, is so important handling of uh, what's uh, the, you know, the, the next to the last word, the last word. You cannot hear the last word till you've heard the next to the last word. And that's Bonhoeffer. Mm -hmm. Again, that's an expositional comment. Mm -hmm. It's expositional. You've got to let a text get you ready for, for a, a great breakthrough. And, uh, and, and I, I, li I like him. So but I like Bonhoeffer. I've read him extensively. I have everything of Bonhoeffer as much as I can. I have everything of Karl Barth, and I love Karl Barth's attention to uh, words. Uh, I just love it. Even in the little book, uh, uh, Dogmatics and Outline, the, the use of uh, his understanding of language is, is so good. And uh, Lewis, of course, and Tolkien. I love Tolkien's uh, brilliant essay on fairy tales which is in the letters to Charles Williams. That, that's the best part of that book. Better than Dorothy Sayers' story uh, on the story, better than Lewis. But Tolkien got it. That sudden turn of joy and his exp explanation of the sudden turn of joy. And really, is he's sharing his eucatastrophe argument that one cr Lewis to Christ. It was that argument from Tolkien. And it is a, a word. It was a word study. If I recall from your, some of your C.S. Lewis studies, there is a reason why he, Lewis went from the sort of apologetics at stake in mere Christianity to the, Nar the Chronicles of Narnia. There's the narrative that, uh, for which the apologetics might, that don't make sense apart from a grander narrative that he wanted to tell. Is that something that you, uh, if, I may be mistaken in some of the things that you've said in the past about Lewis, but. No, I, I love this about Lewis. Uh, in 1939, he broke his silence because uh, he blundered in uh, Pilgrim's Regress and lost a lot of friends in Oxford. In fact, that's the real reason he was defeated for professorship with three votes at Oxford. And uh, they, they were, they were uh, offended the fact that he wrote this uh, and, and mm -hmm. he was so careless about what he said about Sigmund Freud. That's why I love the play Freud's Last Tape, that uh, last session mm -hmm. about Lewis. It's wonderful because Lewis did make fun of Freud and, and he needed to make peace with Freud. That's another story. But anyway, uh, Lewis wrote Problem of Pain and uh, James Welsh, at BBC read Problem of Pain. He didn't know anything about C.S. Lewis, but he read Problem of Pain and he said it changed his life. And then James Welch is the head of BBC Religious Broadcasting. He's the one that got Dorothy Sayers to do uh, Man Born to be King. And then he got Lewis. See, Dorothy Sayers first. She uh, did her, her, her episodes starting in December of, of 41 and ended the beginning of 42. Lewis starts in 42. And the, the heart of the, the, it's a grim time. And, uh, and James Welch writes a letter to him and says, I've read your book, The Problem of Pain, and it's changed my life. And I think England needs this now. We're in pain. And would you be willing to give some broadcast talks? Originally, just four. Well, you've mentioned Bonhoeffer in, uh, in a moment ago, and there's this line uh, in his lectures on preaching, which I uh, probably discovered first from you, uh, these lectures uh, in No Rusty Swords. And I've heard you practice this and, and perhaps have heard it in different ways from you, but he has this line, Bonhoeffer, at one point. He says, the source of the preached word is not the pious Christian experience or consciousness of the preacher, nor the need of the hour of the congregation, nor the desire to improve and influence others. All of these things quickly collapse and lead to resignation. 
These motivations and forces are not enough. The only valid source of the sermon is the commission of Christ to proclaim the gospel. The contemporary situation is not sufficient to determine the content of the sermon. The dealings of God with men as they are testified in, in the Bible, as they are testified to in the Bible, and made known through the teachings of the church is sufficient. Hmm. That, it, oh yes, of course, I agree with this too. If you, if you have too much of an agenda, it could be a godly agenda. Uh, and I, I've said this to a lot of young pastors. Don't throw into the end of the sermon uh, a lot of rhetoric that is all true, but it's not being explained. It's being it's almost like a, a mantra. You're throwing it in. Uh, we, we want to go to the foot of the cross now. The ground is leveled there, and uh, the blood of Christ will cleanse us. And Now, notice all those amazing words that are being uh, used but not described, not explained, not understood. Don't do that. When you get to the end of a main discovery point that's been made in the text, then stop. Mm -hmm. You know, stop earlier. And, you know, and, but don't feel that you have to say, now, what we're going through in, in the world today, I don't know. Uh, I even, did you know, I, I did get published by uh, Will Wellerman at Duke. He wanted me to, uh, he said, what sermon did you preach at University Presbyterian Church the Sunday after 9-11? And so I sent it to him. And then they, did you, did you see that book? I did. It's called After 9-11. He published, there's a lot of different, very famous people. I think Henry Sloan Coff and a lot of people. And they're me. But mine is really one of the only ones that I just stuck to my text. And then we prayed. Uh, and I, and I, I often treated great na national tragedies that way, that in the pastoral prayer, we're going to pray about it. But the sermon, we're going to stick with the text that we were in and let it speak. And then hope that the, by the Holy Spirit's uh, uh, is the one that makes things relevant anyway, that it will be relevant. But it just so happened that the, the text that I had, that I was in the midst of, turned out to be a great text for that Sunday, according to Will Willimon. He put it in there. Yes, I stuck to the, the Lectio Continua text as well. And I, and I learned this from you, but also from Bart and Bonhoeffer, that the text somehow absorbs the world. The, the, this business of trying to, to make the Bible relevant to my world is uh, part of our problem. It's making our world relevant to the text. Yeah. And I think I've learned that as much from you as anyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Bart has a, has a line where he didn't like, uh, he didn't like Tillich's uh, approach that Tillich's correlation is we'll discover what are the huge crises, and then we'll see where the Bible is relevant. Uh, but then Bart had that great one-liner. One in, in, I think it's in, in the letters to Bultmann that, that Urban is probably. Then that means that we get to ask the questions. What if God can ask questions? Let the text ask the questions. And, uh, and it does. It will. Yes. Many congregations, uh, I suppose because they've had experienced expository preaching in ways that, are, uh, that have been boring or, uh, uh, or poorly executed, but many congregations don't, would, would, would be a little wary of having uh, someone who said, I, you know, I would like to, to do expository preaching. Uh, uh, what are some of the, uh, uh, what advice would you give to a congregation that, that, uh, that uh, well, let me, let me go back and rephrase this. I, I'm looking at my notes and trying to make sense of this. Many congregations do not want or think that they do not want this sort of preaching, perhaps because it's been poorly executed or performed in the past. But 
What advice would you give to a congregation that wants expository preaching? Are there conditions for the possibility of mm-hmm. this in a congregation? I, I would say, and I've said this to a lot of young, young pastors, uh, model it without telling them what you're doing. Uh, model, and I, one way you can model it is offer a special class that, that sounds very interesting to people and they are willing to, and maybe it's over some, something that is very currently, uh, you know, on their mind. And, and in that, then, find opportunities to let a text really uh, speak, to, uh, speak in the midst of that. Uh, in, in, in that study. Earl, your, your preaching consistently reflects what Karl Barth calls the joy of discovery. Mm. This joy may be, uh, in, it's, I've experienced it as very contagious, uh, but I'm not sure it can be taught uh, in a classroom. What do you think uh, about how, how do you keep these uh, sermons so uh, from being so boring, can can you say something about the mystery of preaching? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there there is a mystery, and I you know I do think it has several components. One is uh, the, uh, the biggest is the the mystery of the Holy Spirit itself, mm-hmm. the fact that God Himself makes His own validation and does the validating. The other though is the uh, the fact that we need people fluency. Uh, and that, you know, the black church is really mastered that. A black pastor, African-American pastor, is very people fluent. Uh, and sometimes that can get you in trouble because you know too much about your people, but you, you do understand them. Mm-hmm. So you need to be fluent. You need to know if you're in a ministry where near a high school, you need to know about that high school. And you need to know the kids in that high school. You need to know what they're doing. And then that's people fluency. And then I think the uh, the biblical fluency, studying so that you do understand the text yourself, and that's hard work. And so you do that. Mm-hmm. So make that a major goal. Mm-hmm. Uh, arrange your week so your week has time for you. Don't ever write a sermon on Saturday. I, I learned that a long time ago. Mm-hmm. I always write, had my sermon done by Thursday, and that then meant it just brewed in my brain from Saturday till Sunday. But I never wrote it on Sunday. Pastors who write their sermons on Sunday fill them with with, uh, uh, analogies and stuff they borrow from somebody else. But it's not, or or maybe something that happened to them that week, but the, the text isn't the big thing. So if the text had been the big thing up till Thursday and you, and you really got, you got so excited about the text, then it's just ruminating in your brain. That helps. And then, so I would call that the message fluency. You've got to really understand that message as best you can and the words and what, and what the hard words are and stuff like that. Calvin has this line uh, about preaching with one's eyes open, not being oblivious to who's sitting in front of you. Yes. And you have, you have said that reading people's faces is important. You know, it's always true. All the years I was here, when I would meet people in grocery stores, and I did a lot, uh, airports, wherever, I had people say, hey, I go to your church. I said, well, where do you sit? And they always loved that. Where, and I, they said, well, I sit over in the left side. Yep, I'll watch for you. I know where you sit. And I did, I knew where everybody sat. Well, you have reached many people through your sermons, audio uh, sermons throughout the world. And you've reached a lot of people you couldn't see. Uh, And I just want to thank you on behalf of many of us who didn't sit under your teaching directly, but indirectly from a distance, from a distance, we have been so nourished by you in your ministry. Hey, I will tell you one funny thing. I was asked to give a sermon and tape it here that was on the national, when they had the national public, public, you know, it was NBC had it. Mm -hmm. And so they had a crew came and they, did it in this church, he wanted to record me, and they had to turn the entire air conditioning system off in this church because it was fouling up their recording. And so they had to turn all the air conditioning off and I went to a room with them. And then I was really nervous about doing it because I don't like to preach in front of a mic. And he said to me, now, um, uh, this guy was a pro, 
and he said, when you talk, I want you to do this. I want you to see a truck driver in Nevada who's driving his truck, and he might get a little sleepy maybe, but he's driving his truck, and he's turned you on, and he, you're, he's listening to you. And you know, it made, it, it, I got through that sermon that way. And I did two sermons. I don't know if they're very good, but I did think of that truck driver. You know, yeah. he suddenly became a person to me, yes. and so that that guy did help me for that. Yeah. Earl, can we actually just get like a quick, um, like a concluding statement? Like, thanks so much for having me. Oh, hey, I, I, you know, I, I feel uh, it's such a reward for me to see you, and taking on this post, and and. I love Theology Matters, and, and I love the, the whole idea of it, that it does matter. Mm-hmm. But it has to be made real. And, uh, and that's I, what you, you've done in your ministry, and I'm so proud of you. And I remember meeting you in Princeton. And I'm glad I'm in a photo with you, too, at your graduation. That's that right. proves we were there together. That's right. Hey, that's God right. bless you. Thank you, sir. You have been a, such a blessing to our lives. Thank you. Thank you.